not exactly hidden. He awoke to the sensation of grime and exhaustion so deep it hurt. He opened his eyes and sat up slowly, feeling as if every joint had rusted over in the process even as his life flashed before his eyes. He's in a hospital room with numerous monitors around him. Should you feel like you're getting better rather than dying when in a hospital? Wasn't that the point? He reaches up to his throbbing head and finds a strange metal helmet there. One he feels out the clasp of and removes it. A retention helmet. If he just went through a healing coma, then, ah, it was expedited. That means his family needs him. He puts the helmet aside and catches sight of something. His left hand. He grips it with his right. The memories had been a blur thanks to the retention helmet, but it stands out clearly now. This was what he grew back. This was why he needed the coma. He had lost his hand. There was death in the night and he tried to help his family, but lost a hand for his trouble and he heard something explode as the same laser beam that took his hand hit something else. Something watery enough to detonate when every drop of liquid inside it turned into steam. He was struck on the head, nearly felt his horn snap off and now awoke here. Still, the appalling wallpaper and slight droning to the lights lets him know exactly where he is. Nodok Central Hospital. If it's still standing, then whatever happened that night didn't burn down everything, which means some of his family survived. Whatever the hell had happened, as useless as he had been. The slight sound of footsteps is loud enough to sound like a drumbeat in his skull. He pushes aside the blankets and pulls out the needle-feeding nutrients into his arm. He's awake now, no longer having all of his and the local axiom directed into restoring a lost body part. He doesn't need it anymore. The axiom will sustain him. He stands up just as the door opens and Dr. Yil Jar walks in. She seems surprised he's up so swiftly, but rallies herself. Dr. Tarn, you're up earlier than expected. I'm just a mathematician, Dr. Jar. I'm no doctor in a hospital, even if I am. It's occasional accountant. Kale Tarn replies before cracking his neck and Dr. Jar flinches outright. What happened? We were attacked. A raid from Tars and Twin with a combined force battalion, Dr. Jar says, and Kale sucks in a shocked breath between his teeth. An official attack? Are they at war? Has something happened to break the Empress' power and open war has begun? He looks to the curtained window with a slight amount of fear. What will he see if he opens them? The burnt-out husk and burial ground of his family. I'm not sure how to tell you this, Kale, but things didn't go as expected, Dr. Jar says, allowing a bit of familiarity to creep in. He's worked as an accountant for the hospital more than once and is somewhat familiar with her, but not enough for it to be casual. Just say it, he says as he walks to the window and opens it. No dock stands. It's been blasted and many buildings are burnt to a husk, but it stands. Your son saved us. He saved all of us as the judge of the damned, she says, and Kale Tarn just stares at her. What? He ran to the dark forest and summoned an entire army of sorcerers. They slaughtered our attackers with contemptuous ease. Then, then they hunted down exactly who was responsible and why and gave them to your little boy for sentencing. He spared none. Dr. Jar whispers and Kale just stares at her for a moment. My Cal's Tarn orchestrated the deaths of our attackers he asks in horror, and Dr. Jar pulls out her communicator and holds it out to him. You best see for yourself, she says, and he looks upon the paused video. The contents chills his very soul, high-profile targets systematically taken, his own son screaming for vengeance, and then the sentences. Those terrible fates, devoured by beasts, buried alive, torn asunder, fed molten tritite, his little boy mutilating a woman with a knife until she more closely resembled the end result of canning meat. A deep sense of shame washes over him as the movie ends and his son is left weeping and blood-soaked in the dark forest, surrounded by an entire army of alien sorcerers, not to mention the implications of Cal's 
own words. Thera is dead, Vera and Jen. He mentioned an aunt, was it one of his own sisters? One of Thera's siblings. He wordlessly hands the communicator back to Dr. Jar and considers before brushing at the sleeve that's been cut off in order to keep something soaked with blood away from him. Is any fresh clothing of mine here or will I be using the lost and found? Your family has been informed of your recovery already. They're on their way here, Dr. Jar says and Kale nods. Thankfully, with a more natural axiom flow in his flesh and blood, the brutal throbbing sensation is fading a little more every second. Thank you, he says as he tries to think about how best to handle things. His family was never large, but one of his wives is dead, possibly a sister, maybe a sister-in-law and two children. His son is now rubbing elbows with an entire army off sorcerers and likely is one himself, one with a reputation for brutal judgment. This is well and truly outside of any and all training he ever had growing up. The education system has thoroughly failed him in this. He takes a few deep breaths and considers. Then the sound of hurrying feet in the hallways rings out. Dr. Jar moves to the side and moments later, the door opens. Dad, Cal's Tarn shouts as he barges in and then outright tackles him into a hug. A strange man, either a Tret or, more likely, one of those new humans, is leaning against the opposite wall as if on guard but also at a respectful distance. Koga nods as the doctor steps out of the room to allow Cal's Tarn and his father time to reunite and help each other heal. He adjusts his footing somewhat and gets ready for a long wait. The kid is out of his general malaise and that is a good sign. He makes a point of not listening into what they're saying. This is something private and personal. So his attention is instead focused on the rest of the building. There is what sounds like a procession just a floor down, likely relating to the fact that with Kale Tarn awake, the expedited healing coma can be applied to someone else and empty the hospital all the faster. Seeing that thing active from a distance had been akin to watching a tornado from afar. It was harsh on the local axiom and very likely could even bring pain to those overly attuned to it. He had done a little more research which had gone into his own report about things. Generally, you could maintain a normal healing coma around one and only one expedited healing coma. But any more than that singular expedited coma and it would disrupt the other healing comas in dangerous ways. Ways that could turn an entire coma healing ward into a morgue. The body keeps healing at intense speeds, but with no axiom to feed on it cannibalizes the body and it can go past the point of no return. Some terrorist attacks used Kutha devices that disrupted the axiom in just such a way as to ruin healing comas in the past. Granted from Koga's preliminary research, these events were far more common in thriller novels, and if those books were to be believed, they usually targeted men only at the most tragic of times. It was like amnesia from a soap opera massively misunderstood and made far more common seeming by those who adore the call of drama. He pockets the communicator and pays attention as he hears the procession from below climb up the stairs. He offers what seems to look only like a glance and then has to fight down a grin as Baroness Uth Tear emerges at the head of the little parade. He offers a slight wave to the well-dressed woman and goes back to his guard duties. There are whispers, and the Baroness walks up to him. Koga, it was quite the thing to see how you and yours dealt with those that caused this calamity. Why are you here? Young Cal's Tarn is as yet untrained. He does not go anywhere outside the dark forest without a fully realized sorcerer nearby. He's with his father, the man who just awoke in that room. Koga explains, pointing directly at the hospital room. So, the judge is there? She asks as she looks over to the room in question. The news crew behind her catches the look and some reporters are saying their own pieces into small microphones. Could you please stop it with the silly nicknames? He's a child, Koga remarks with a raised eyebrow. 
Excuse me, Sir Sorcerer, one of the reporters asks, and Koga glances her way. There are many women around Serbo and beyond that believe your retaliation against the Twin Tars Battalion was completely over the top, and the execution of the five women to be both brutal and unwarranted. What do you have to say to that? He raises an eyebrow and gestures for the crowd to follow as he walks to a window some ten paces away. He points out and indicates several destroyed buildings in the process of being rebuilt. Four days ago, this village was pristine and untouched. The closest thing it had done to offend anyone was daring to produce high-quality goods that always sold out before their immediate competitors did. So, for this crime of feeding people to the best of their ability, those five women that I and my brothers executed came together and condemned them all to death. But don't you think that... I think that if you condemn others to death and damnation, then you open yourself up to equal levels of brutality. It was them, and they, that made this about murder and torture. That we only killed those that attacked and the ones who sent them speaks of great self-restraint on our part. In older times, sending a child screaming and weeping into the embrace of the dark forest meant that there was a brutal retaliation approaching. Or would you prefer that we had simply trained Cal's Tarn until he was ready to face armies alone and set him after those who wronged him? Do you hate the Twin and Tars people so much? What? Why would you say such a thing? You're the one complaining that a sorcerer's retaliation was as large as it was. Well, they used to be a hell of a lot bigger. Or do you just not care about how much actual damage was caused and just want a ratings bump? Koga asks. And before she can say anything else, Uth Tyr nudges her back a little. Daiki of the Koga clan, I am hosting a charity ball and auction in honor of those lost in this attack. The proceeds of the ball and auction shall be used in the rebuilding of Nodok and will also be paying for all the medical concerns of the people here. I see. I'll have to speak with the others, but I may have something to contribute to the auction. Koga notes. Granted, what he's thinking of will likely horrify the audience, but at the same token, it will likely make a mint as well. Also, the message it sends out will be as clear as crystal. Excellent, but I was wondering about you yourself, Uth Tyr asks, and Koga tilts his head. Would you do the honor of being my date for the ball? Really? He asks, surprised. It's not that the girl is ugly. Far from it, the shimmering night black hair and naturally pale complexion has her look like she walked out of a classical painting and then through a one of the Western Victorian era to steal a dress. I thought I terrified you. Only at first it was shocking to meet you suddenly with dire warnings of someone attempting to frame me for their sorcerer creating cruelty. Then you showed patience, understanding and good grace to deal with things, she says as the camera crews pay very close attention to what's going on. I'm not much of a date. I prefer to fade into the background in public events. Koga admits, not mentioning that it's actually part of some of his remembered training. Just being part of the scenery and social events lets you pick up so many secrets that people may as well just hand you blackmail material on an open platter. That wasn't a no, Uth Tyr notes. It wasn't a no, but I am going to need to speak to some people about how to be more presentable at a party rather than simply part of the background. So it's a yes, she asks. It is, but as I said, I'll need to work on standing out more than at the last party I was at. Which one was that, she inquires. Precisely my point. 